Um, I'm Stephen Haben, a senior um, data science consultant at the Energy Systems Catapult. Um, I've got blonde hair, ginger beard, glasses, and um, black shirt. Um, yeah, so uh, I work at the Energy Systems Catapult, and you know we we sort of sit between industry policy and uh, academia, and and we're there to support innovators and and help them uh, bring their innovations to markets and help support the move to net zero. Um, I'm in particular in the digital team, and we believe digitalization is a is a core element of of trying to help us get to net zero because we need to be monitoring things, we need to be sort of automating things and controlling devices to be able to make sure that we can utilize renewables to the full extent um, and help make sure we can support the the energy system really. Um, open source is quite an attractive option for us because obviously we're trying to support as many uh, as many as um, organizations as we can, you know, and to demonstrate some of the benefits of, of, of data, digital and data science. Um, so just wanted to say a little bit about that. So the case study that we were um, talking about for ours was um, this uh, catalog of projects on energy data. Um, it was originally a project through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, um, uh, through Energy Rev, which was a consortium of universities looking at energy products. Uh, and then we worked on this um, with Coventry University to sort of help develop it. And it was something that then we were going to take on as a product. So they did the majority of the baseline sort of software development. And the idea is really to sort of present information on uh, public energy projects, you know, so we can understand the landscape. Um, you know, the idea is that it would help sort of reduce duplication of efforts. It would help sort of aid reproducibility, you know, and help maybe drive innovation, you know, understand areas where, you know, there is is some maybe concerted effort needed, you know, and then maybe also help people work together. So, you know, in general, initially, we we're thinking about this as some something that could support sort of um, better understanding of the funding landscape. But as we sort of developed it, um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, um, you know, we sort of looked at further features which would maybe help, um, you know, other stakeholders as we discovered there was actually more uses for what we were doing. Um, so, yeah, there's kind of two main now components of this system. There's sort of the sort of search aspect, which looks at projects, people and organizations. And then there's sort of visualization aspect, which can sort of summarize a lot of that information. Um, into sort of an easy digestible and, and sort of you know, a method for analyzing some of the information in there. So um, I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the development um, and then some of the challenges, because I think it's really key to sort of see, you know, some of the, the issues we've had um, and then sort of some of the lessons, I hope, um, that are quite useful to the community uh, going forward. So um, initially, we sort of tried to... Um, you know, interact with as, as wide a community as possible of interviews, um, whether that's with regulators, so government, academics, and commercial. And with commercial, we also tried to make sure that we, we looked at small to medium businesses who may, may benefit um, from this tool, as well as maybe larger corporations who, uh, who maybe have, you know, a lot of their own in-house abilities. We also then start to set up a working group which had expertise that we didn't have within within the group that was developing this. Um, so we we built up a brilliant sort of team of people who had great information about licensing, which I've already heard spoke about this morning. Uh, data management, best practice, um, but also accessibility. So you know, um, although we had our own ideas of you know how we could make sure that this tool was was uh, available for everyone, um, you know, bringing in different views was was brilliant for us to sort of understand. Um, actually was things we were definitely missing. And, you know, the experts in this area really helped us with that. Uh, and then I just also say the practitioners hub as well, you know, that was very useful for us. Hey. It was great to hear. Hello. Is there a, a voice out there? I'll, um, so, you know, we also, the practitioners hub was great. Um, we had lots of sort of meetings with various people and it was great to also hear other, other, other viewpoints on these things. Um, and sort of look at some new techniques and some different approaches to look at our problem. Um, and all this kind of fed into sort of the features that we could develop for this. So, you know, one of the things what we ended up doing was looking at how we could provide different support for this. We then produced sort of a wiki page that would um, that help support people using this with lots of details on it. Uh, we developed, we also found that sort of, you know, videos would be very helpful to different people who maybe could uh, find the wiki less accessible. Um, 
And then we kind of focused on a couple of new features, which we hadn't really um, thought about in too detail. We had a visualization system, but as we realized some of the use cases um, could focus a bit more on some of the visualizations, um, you know, we realized we wanted to develop some default dashboards, which means that people could just jump straight into this challenge without wor worrying about having to do it themselves. So we found there was some key areas we could we could develop for them, which would look, for instance, at sort of different organizations and their funding landscape, look at sort of the overall landscape for different subject areas, um, and also maybe even ones which could um, which could help sort of focus on collaborations and, and sort of how people work together. And then finally, we're looking a bit more at the updating the messaging system as we realized that this product could be used uh, a bit more for people to sort of collaborate or find ideas or or look at different areas. So that was um, sort of really key to feed into those features. Um, <clears throat> I do want to mention challenges as well, because, you know, we faced some throughout the project um, as well. And I think it's really key, um, key learnings here. I think, you know, as I said, we, we sort of developed the users maybe looking differently from sort of what we initially thought about this as, as a kind of funding landscape view. Um, to then looking a bit more about sort of, you know, research and maybe using it to sort of identify areas of, of, um, of you know, of potential impact they could make, you know, and also organizations maybe looking for um, other partners they could work with. Um, I would also say there was a lot of initial, there was a steep initial effort. Um, I, I guess we're in a kind of unique position to some degree that there was a project that could help develop this and then there was someone like the energy systems catapult who could take it on for sort of continued support um but obviously you know there was a, a steep effort putting all the right tools together the right sort of programs and plugins to to develop it and it's still being developed now you know to some extent um we, one we're still working on is sort of having this self-sustaining community we're still working on some features we'd like to have finished before we sort of do um, you know, a mass rollout of this and engage the community in more depth. Um, but, you know, we believe that, you know, a lot of the, the development and the, the value will come of building that community who then can add and create their own features for the system. Um, and then the last two really about sort of, you know, how we find the time to develop this, you know, we as a catapult have lots of, you know, projects we have to be working on and we, we're always trying to do as much as we can to support the sector. Um, and therefore, we sort of have to balance the times we have on this project and what parts of that um, of that platform we can work on. Um, and the other bits are really about, you know, the competition with other projects, which, you know, we, we have to get done and have specific deadlines. So, you know, balancing that isn't always easy. Um, and we, you know, we try to do the best we can with that. And ironically, as we talk today on the this platform, uh, currently we have got an error on our, on our, our platform, which we're trying to work on, which is sort of um, with dealing with the sign-in issues, but it sort of shows you that this is a continual problem and that's why continual support is a major part of this. Um, I'm not going to talk too much in this last slide, but I just want to sort of highlight the issues that came out of our um, uh, out of our case study that we, we wrote up with um, uh, the Turing Way, you know, openness, making sure we had diverse, um, you know, uh, committees of people putting their minds on this and their viewpoints. Um, trying to build an active community here, you know, of getting as many eyes on this as possible, understanding who will use it, um, identifying, our on, you know, an ongoing model for support. We we understand the idea that this could change over time. Um, and something about the basics, you know, so again, it's, as I said, someone mentioned licenses. It's not necessarily everybody's favorite topic, but it's really important, you know, uh, that we get that right. Otherwise, you know, nobody will uh, use it. So I hope that was interesting and there was some uh, useful information there. I guess we'll take questions. Is it at the end, Lysander, or uh, is it right now? At the end. Thank okay. you, Stephen. Thank Perfect. you very much. Thank you very um, much. Now we're going to call Wenjia Tang, who is the head of data of DE Hall. We already have met her before, so she's going to come here. I'm going to add your... One second, that is thinking. <laughs> and I think you need to ping me then the, for her. Okay. Thank you, Alex. 
Right. Um, so I hope that I'm not going to bore you for the next 10 minutes or so after talking quite a little bit in the morning. But um, just trying to give you a kind of overview and like a 10,000 feet um, view on what we're doing at Digital and why we're here. Um, so first of all, Digital is probably quite briefly introduced this morning is in the road haulage sector. And our vision is to decarbonize in the UK's road network. Um, so a bit about myself. Um, so I have done a PhD study in electrical engineering um, about 16 years ago. And my topic was optimization <laughs> algorithms. So funny enough that you know, this is part of the day work that I'm currently doing. And then I went on uh, joining IBM for nine years, becoming a senior managing consultant. And then um, I went to join Digital as a startup about two and a half years ago to help build the company's data team and make sure that you know it's actually in the overall roadmap of being digitized um, for the whole sector. Um, so a bit information about the sector. My marketing team has done a great job about this. <laughs> so right now, 89% of all the goods in the UK are shifted by road. So it's a very different landscape from other countries, especially in the continental, continental countries. And about 19%, almost 20% of the shipments, you know, you'll see on the road, HGVs, they are running empty. So they are covered very nicely with the curtains or you know, in the boxes, but actually one in five of them are empty inside. And the whole industry still relies upon paper and phone. So you can see when there is a um, shipment coming, all the people, the brokers, they their instinct is to pick up the phone and call their familiar holders to say, can you do the job for me? And there's very limited a kind of um, setting for them to think about digital digitization first. Um, so why digital? So this is our CEO and he was previous DHL. And about three years ago, uh, he came up and just to say, I'm going to set up this startup as a captive one so that we can you know, be in, more innovative and, you know, and try out new ideas. And it was emerged out of frustration because of the siloed transportation practices. As I introduced in the morning that, you know, most of the customers in our uh, carriers that are operating in silos, it's very, very hard to actually break the barrier between them to, to share insights, share data, not to mention collaboration. Um, so companies normally have this capability of doing planning. Otherwise, they probably will go bust in business you know, quite early on. So they are able to optimize their own network, but not necessarily have the collaboration mindset to collaborate with each other. And those resulting in the inefficiency, as we just saw in like one in five, they are running empty because they, if I have a shipment from London to Birmingham today, and you have a shipment from Coventry to let's say um, Essex tomorrow or later down today, those two people don't know those existence. So it would be most likely my driver going to Birmingham, deliver the good and come back empty. And then very similarly for the other driver doing the other bit part of the business. So if we can actually optimize the network together and make sure that we can maximize the utility of the vehicles that not only save you know, the cost altogether, but also we are decarbonizing the whole UK network. Um, so um, what we're doing, just a very quick introduction of the company's business. So we are um, kind of market place maker and we have the system to allow people to book their job with us and from there, from, from then on, we provide the end-to-end one-stop uh, one shop service for them. Um, we also give the drivers um, an app so that we can track the GPS 
So whenever they're on the road, we know where they are. And also we have worked together with over 700 holiers across the country. They're all vetted. They are all compliant with our um, regulation um, requirement. So we provide the 24 seven service for a support for all the shipment. So how do we work? So you probably say that there is a bit of AI sign or similar to AI sign there. We try to leverage the technology and the AI algorithms to optimize what, whatever shipments that we have got in the system. And uh, we also operate in not only in the UK, now we expanded to Mexico last year and we are going to expand to um, uh, other countries later down the um, in the next in the second half of the year and next year. Um, so there are quite a few um, cases that when we talked about in the case study that we think AI, especially the, um, for example, Gen AI would be helping us massively. Um, one particular case, probably you haven't, for me, before joining this company, I thought it's not a problem, but there's a very, very big problem for us is when we get the shipment information from shipper, they probably need to input their um, shipment details like from London to Birmingham. And this is a 26 ton uh, vehicle and I have how many pallets to ship so that those are the granular detail that we will need to plan our work. But for our um, drivers or you know for uh, for the for the people whoever provide the data for us they didn't think that's important so chances are they will just go through the down the the input line and then click the first one in the drop down box so a lot of cases will get the shipment that is one kilograms um and probably just for <laughs> Uh, for for the customer, it's not a big deal because they still get the location right. But for us, it's a massive problem because we need to understand the weight. One is for carbon reporting that we have this regulatory, regulatory um, alignment that we need to report carbon uh, emission. And secondly, it just inhibits us from combining shipment together because if you don't know how heavy a vehicle is, and there is a maximum limit that how, how heavy the, the, the vehicle can be, then there's no chance you can combine this with any other um, shipment, even within the proximity of the location. So that is a very tangible challenge for us. And what we were thinking about is, you know, when people book shipment, there was a very, you know, straightforward kind of solution for that, for me, at least with Gen AI, is when you put one kilo, they can search into our database, search or tap into the common sense knowledge to say one kilo does not sound right. With this type of good and with this location, with this customer, you usually, your input, your input should be this range. But by some auto correction would help us tremendously. So that's one particular use talked about, you know, it doesn't sound like a kind of tricky problem, but it's a very, you know, real problem for us. And another challenge for us is, you know, because of the data literacy of our employees, um, chances are they need to know, for example, we have 700 holiers, so they need to know their performance. They need to know which one they want to choose. They shouldn't always choose the cheapest one, but they need to choose the best quality with the best value for money. Now, for them, trying to know their past performance and how they behave in the past, well, whether they have delivered good on time, what's the percentage, is the biggest barrier for them to understand the issue because they don't have any data skills. And with Gen AI, if you can just develop this, you know, chat box tools, things like that, input a carrier's name that give you all the information that they ever need, that would facilitate them making daily operational decisions and making sure that, you know, we can provide as best service as we could. Um, so those are the kind of use cases that we um, talked about in this case study. Um, and another one, which is coming back to our, um, our mission here is to reduce the empty miles. 
So we have been working on this, so using AI and algorithms to reduce empty miles, but there must be a better way, always be a better way to actually optimize it better, making sure that empty miles can be reduced further. So anything that, you know, we can tap into the open source, open, open um, working schema, that would be really beneficial for us. Um, another point that I'd like to make here is to emphasize the education and the training, because it is extremely important. And well, I can say that, you know, the Turing Way and the Innovative UK British AI program can really help because we can, if we understand the industry standard and have a, you know, like playbook that we can educate our employee, educate our people, starting from why you're here, why, why you think this um, open policy could help you, how could you contribute? Because bear in mind, they are the domain expert. You know, they have been doing this job for them a lot of, you know, maybe some of them for the whole life. So there must be something that they can contribute back to how we can leverage those, those domain, domain knowledge to make um, a better software algorithm. Um, so those are the kind of three key elements that we have been working towards. There are quite a few more and uh, would be articulated in the case study itself, but just give you some food for thought. Hopefully that is not um, kind of too boring time that you have sit together with us. And thank you very much. I will take a question towards the end of the, of the final session. Thank you very much, Wendy. I will stop sharing and now we will sadly Lucy Stevenson, who was our expert in residence from uh, the British Antarctic Survey, cannot join us today, but we will make sure that you get uh, access to her case studies is already in Senodo. But, and right now we're going to give the world to Ariel Bennett, who is our program manager at the Alan Turing Institute, and she was the liaison with the ONS case study. Uh, thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you very much. Uh, the standard thing, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I yes, think yes. I can. I think I can see on there. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining today. I am delighted to be here presenting um, to you. Uh, as Ale said, I'm the program manager for tools, practices, and systems at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and in the context of the practitioner hub, I was the Office for National Statistics case study liaison. Um, the Office for National Statistics is the UK's largest independent producer of official statistics. It's the UK's recognized National Statistical Institute, as you might have guessed from its name. And I was delighted to be working with our expert in residence from the Office for National Statistics, Rowan Hemsey, who sadly can't be here today. Um, Rowan is a data scientist at the office at the ONS based in the central team that supports reproducible analysis uh, at ONS and across government. They take on an internal consultancy role, helping teams to adopt good practices when developing analytical code. They work on open source tools that support reproducible analysis. They've also helped to develop and deliver guidance and training on these ideas and techniques. Finally, Rowan currently coordinates the public uh, sector reproducible analytical pipelines network, a community for analysts to, and other data professionals to share their work and try to overcome common challenges. And as part of their participation in the practitioner hub, Rowan was particularly keen to use the case study uh, that we developed as a culture change tool within ONS. There are a lot of excellent practices um, underway being developed and already in place at the Office for National Statistics, but there were still um, areas of uh, underutilization and low adoption um, that they wanted to address uh, partially through um, an informal piece that could serve as, as some thought leadership on uh, adopting open practices. Um, so for this, we interviewed three leaders in open source from across ONS. Uh, we had the co-lead of reproducible analytical pipeline support, the dissemination lead for the integrated data service, and a senior data scientist at the data science campus. The conversation we had with these three leads was incredibly interesting and covered a huge amount of material 
specific real world examples of where open working would have saved time, money and resources, um, but also taking some time to acknowledge the barriers and concerns that people have around open source, open working in the context of ONS, um, particularly uh, there where teams are handling highly sensitive data on a daily basis. Um, so I'm going to whiz through these in the interest of time. We did want to, I did want to sort of acknowledge that there are reasonable barriers um, and concerns that people have um, that we'd identified throughout the case study. First one off is the fear of scrutiny of work, the idea that uh, work needs to be perfect before it's shared um, with the wider uh, audience. Um, we also uh, saw from the interviews that there was a, still a large amount of skills gaps in open practices, people unsure of how to present their work in a way that's uh, understandable to other people, that is able to be reviewed in the open, um, and that also uh, doesn't inadvertently uh, leave uh, gaps or um, expose risks. Um, this is particularly key because there are risks. Uh, people are concerned about accidentally sharing sensitive data or sh sensitive code um, and corresponding concerns around code and data misuse as well. If it's made open, what other actors can come along and uh, take that code and reapply it for different purposes. We are seeing some of these concerns echoed in the conversations around open versus closed uh, generative AI models um, as well at the moment. And finally, we find that there is still a general perception that closed development is safer and more secure because there are fewer eyes on the code um, and therefore you're less likely to have people spot uh, vulnerabilities um, in the code and uh, figure out how to exploit them. However, all of our interviews were unequivocal that the, uh, the benefits and uh, you know, enhancements that come from working openly far outweigh the uh, risks um, when implemented correctly with support, training, and licensing. Um, and I really love this quote from Dan, who's one of our experts, um, uh, who was talking about the possible uh, risks and benefits of working openly. Overall, the risks loom larger in people's minds than they are in reality. It's a bit like fear of flying. On the other hand, the cost of not open sourcing our code is something that doesn't get enough attention. We're risking errors and bugs in code that isn't properly maintained, scrutinized or documented. And we're wasting time waiting for people to have access to projects. So from his perspective, this idea that developing a closed environment where there are fewer eyes on code is actually a, a drawback because there's less scrutiny of the code, you're more likely to have um, vulnerabilities go unreported um, and unaddressed as well. Um, and there's a lot of different incredible quotes throughout the case study, so I do highly recommend you go in and, and take a look at those. Um, so moving on, just some key takeaways from uh, the overall case study itself. Um, first up, open source practices foster collaboration and invite public scrutiny and improvement of source code throughout a project's lifespan. This ultimately contributes to the development of high quality software. Um, alongside that, the adoption of common standards across diverse teams is crucial for ensuring reusability and interoperability of tools and technology. And this in turn elevates the reproducibility of analytical pipelines, making them applicable to various data sets. In the governmental context, these practices play a pivotal role in establishing public trust and engaging users and contributors and ensuring the positive societal impact of data science. Government and institutional support for open source practices is critical and remains critical to its continued um, uptake across wider society. Um, Entities like the Data Science Campus that ONS run and NHS England are instrumental in normalizing the culture of openness in data science and artificial intelligence, um, both within the government and then also, as I mentioned, across various sectors nationally. To enable all of these things to happen, skills initiatives are really critical. They act as catalysts. Um, we need to have people cultivating open skills through um, resources like the Turing Way or Bridge AI, um, and 
we need people to be actively contributing to advancing reproducible analysis approaches um, across government departments, but also across sectors as well. Uh, finally, this is something that emerged from uh, conversations in the case study itself and conversations with Rowan as well. We noted that there's often a balancing act that can be found at the middle management layer in particular in large organizations. Senior leadership buy-in uh, is critical in terms of adopting open working practices right across the organization, but they do tend to be more focused overall on vision and strategic direction. Um, while more junior folks are interested in developing practices which support their direct work and help them to develop their skills. Middle management uh, tend to be stuck between a rock and a hard place, having to balance the uh, implementation of the strategic vision um, and overall direction with developing their teams and also critically managing the risks. This is where a lot of the risk management and uh, cautious um, approaches uh, we really see come to the fore. And so thinking about that is particularly critical to address those concerns from middle management and make sure there's a robust uh, mitigation strategy in place, you know, you're doing regular reviews and things like that, to ensure that they're also on board with the benefits of open practice and how you're going to address those risks as well. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions at the end, um, but I do just want to say a huge thank you to Rowan for organising um, the uh, interviews and for allowing me to be uh, part of the case study. Thank you very much, Ariel and Rowan, for that amazing presentation. Uh, lastly, we'll have Piki Helen, who is the research community manager for the Alan Turing Institute and who is who was the uh, Genomic England's case study liaison. Thank you, Vicky. Well, who? Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, so, as Ali said, I'm Vicky Helen. And I'm a research community manager at the Turing, uh, working on a health project, which is the Turing Roche Partnership. Um, and I was the liaison for the Genomics England case study um, alongside uh, Raphael Sonneband, who was our expert in residence, and also his colleague Maxine McIntosh, who unfortunately neither of them could be here today. Um, just to give some background on Genomics England, so this is a government funded institution um, providing diagnostics for whole genome sequencing. Um, they also have a bank of genome sequences, um, so researchers can access this bank um, and kind of help treatment of patients, help predict disease, um, so obviously working with very sensitive data. So the first thing uh, we did, so I'm going to talk you through our kind of process of the case study. Um, we sat down with Raphael and talked about kind of what we wanted the messaging of the case study to be. Um, particularly, as I mentioned, with Genomics England, it's very sensitive data. So there's a lot of challenges around open science and openness means very different things across the organization. So we thought we'd kind of focus on that for the case study. Something Raphael also wanted to showcase was the Link23 initiative. Uh, this is a fairly new initiative at Genomics England um, that is encouraging data scientists, researchers and developers to share kind of open source tools um, around more equitable practices in genomic research. So some challenges, um, Raphael was quite new at the um, at the Genomics England kind of organization. Um, so there were some kind of initial challenges on who to reach out to, but Maxine was really helpful in kind of getting us some key contacts. Um, and actually sitting down with Raphael to begin with was really helpful um, to kind of understand his perspective um, on openness and kind of what he was bringing to the organization. Um, and as we mentioned, we kind of wanted to showcase a range of perspectives from across Genomics England. So our first interview was with Augusto Rendon, who is the Chief Bioinformatician at Genomics England. Um, I think he was quite an interesting one to start with, as he's someone who's working very hands-on with sensitive data. 
and although he agreed on the importance of openness um it wasn't necessarily a priority for him it was kind of more priority around kind of making sure his tools are reproducible um so i think that was yeah quite an interesting one to start with about kind of what best practice looks like at the organization for kind of technical people Next up, we uh, spoke to Natalie Banner, who is the Director of Ethics at Genomics England. Um, she gave a really different spin on kind of what openness can mean. So obviously, as Director of Ethics, she kind of has patient data at the forefront of her mind. And obviously, there's always this balance with sensitive data between safeguarding it, but also making sure that researchers can collaborate and actually make breakthroughs that will help the patients. So she kind of talked a lot around kind of the importance of openness in terms of kind of promoting collaboration and yeah, using patient data safely, um, but making kind of as much open as possible. And finally, uh, we spoke to Maxine herself, who is program lead for the diversity program at Genomics England. She was really great to have her perspective as she'd been at Genomics England a while, and she kind of helped tie the strands together. She's also very passionate about open science. Um, so kind of talking to her about how we raise awareness of open tools and practices. And also often kind of when we spoke to people at Genomics England, when we said open to them, they were often thinking kind of about open source. But Maxine shared an example of kind of openness in a different flavor. So for example, they had some results they wanted to get out um, as uh, probably a few of you know, the scientific uh, publishing process is very slow. So they decided to share these openly as a blog and she shared the kind of benefits of that. So kind of people coming and kind of wanting to collaborate with them with something they kind of shared openly straight away rather than kind of following that traditional process. So also, I wanted to give a huge shout out uh, to our technical writer, Stuart, who actually wrote up all the case studies. Um, he did a really great job at interviewing and making uh, our lives easier. Um, I think for this case study, as you'll kind of see reflected, um, interviewing from kind of different departments across the organization, give different perspectives of what open can mean. Um, I think it also was useful for Genomics England in giving some markers to look at kind of where practices could possibly change in the future, um, who's kind of open to being open. And Genomics England also said they found connecting with the Turing Way team really useful. I think particularly as Turing is also a government funded organization and could probably be, be said to be quite risk averse. So how you kind of do open science in that sense as well. So I think kind of connecting those two organizations was really useful for them. Um, so now I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Wenja, Stephen, Ariel, and Vicky. Um, we have 10 more minutes to open the floor for questions. Um, Vicky and Wenja, would you like to sit here? And I'm going to stop sharing, and maybe we can pin uh, Stephen and Ariel. Um, I'm going to make one initial question. And then I'm just gonna open the floor. So if you wanna start thinking about a question, this is the right moment. Um, what are the, some of the challenges open source projects have compared to your closed source projects? I'm gonna start this question with Wenjia and Stephen. In this end, yeah. Just, okay. The challenges between open source and closed source. Okay. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm going to read the question again. Yes. What are some of the challenges open source projects have compared to your closed source projects? Right. Okay. So, as a company, we definitely, our instinct whenever there's a new challenge is going to closed source because that is the traditional way of working. But I think open source actually brought new um, perspective for us, um, especially around the uh, community building and trying to um, share the knowledge and also encourage this open data strategy across the industry. So it's pretty much not kind of commercially driven, 
but it's more longer vision driven to encourage this collaboration and innovative culture in the company, as well as the industrial wise data sharing and and then the common standard working. Um, so, well, if, if, if in terms of challenge, I think if you don't have that vision, don't have that buy in from the leadership team, then probably that's that's very difficult to implement. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Stephen, do you want to compliment? S similar in some ways, um, but often we we sort of we often are driving to uh, support the industry wherever we can. Um, so you know there is a drive to sort of put together projects which sort of allow you know they're publicly funded projects often, so we sort of can release things as much as we can in that sense. I think for us maybe it's more about. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities for for open source. The closed one, you know, obviously we we sort of client driven in that sense sometimes. Um, with the open source, I guess it's more about you know, um, do we have the uh, ability to sort of make sure there's the right degree of quality assurance with what we do release then, and that you know we can maintain it and make sure you know we usually have very good buy-in in terms of you know the the. The sort of managers who understand especially you know that's so it's more about prioritizing in some ways in some ways some of the open source projects but then making sure that we have the right quality with with the products that we release and we can maintain them as well so i think there's sort of different questions for us a little bit um just to make sure that we can produce a product that we know supports the energy system as well it's not just supporting one organization necessarily um but as many as we can you know, if it's it's not just for one network operator, we try and support, you know, all of the network operators. Thank you, Stephen. And for Ariel and Biggie, did you learn new things, aspects of your organizations through the case study writing? Biggie, do you want to start or? <laughs> First, Ariel. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, I don't work at Genomics England, but I think. They said from a case study that different, like as I kind of showed, they interviewed a lot of different people. And I think it was interesting to see, I think Raphael and Maxine both work very openly and are passionate about openly working. But I think seeing those different aspects of the organization where perhaps it wasn't a priority was interesting for them. Um, I think also particularly as it was the cheering way interviewing these people, they perhaps more candid with us. So I think that was an interesting aspect. Um, I think something similar to what Ariel touched upon in her um, presentation is that what we, the sense we kind of got from Augusto, the chief bioinformatician, is that it's not necessarily a priority to them to be working in open source, but for legitimate reasons around kind of time, sensitive data, um, so I guess there's kind of more work to be done there. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Ariel, do you want to go next? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I learned a lot about uh, the ONS uh, by uh, being in these interviews and sort of compiling the case study. I think one of the things I was really struck by is that there's several, They, the interviewees came up with a lot of good real world examples of uh, times where open working would have been beneficial um, because it would have saved a lot of time and energy um, and resources. So there was um, one example uh, that they put in where uh, somebody took on um, taking over, took on um, maintenance of a, uh, a markdown package. They went uh, on the shared government Slack to try and find the users and discovered two other packages that were also doing the same thing. Um, and realized that they'd all been maintained sort of independently and hadn't been talking to each other because they weren't open. Uh, if they'd been open, there would have just been one package and they could have had everyone working to sort of solve the same problems together rather than having to figure it out individually um, and, and kind of uh, in that regard. So that was where it sort of, they view the closed working, particularly in a government situation, particularly when it comes to things like code, as very inefficient um, in terms of you know time and, and resources and maintenance. Um, but they're also, they have a very nuanced view on this. They're not blind to the concerns and the considerations that need to happen and need to be taken into account with things like sensitive data. 
um, you know, they, it's a very balanced view. They're not open at all costs. They are, we need to do this in a way that is sensible, that gives people the skills to continue working openly, to think about how we license stuff, what we make available and to whom. Uh, so more open by design. Um, and I think that's, that's quite reassuring to know about the uh, Office for National Statistics. Thank you very much, Ariel. I think as a matter of time, we need to take a break now, but we can go back and ask questions at the end of the next panel. We have 10 minutes break. There is coffee and biscuits.